The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third of today's uh, sessions from Smart Vision Europe. And this last one, we're talking about decision trees. Uh, my name is Charles Quinn. I'm an analyst consultant at Smart Vision Europe, and I'm joined online today by my colleague, Rachel Clinton. Rachel will be making sure that everybody's logged in correctly and fielding questions as we're going along. If you haven't joined any of these sessions before, then just a few housekeeping points we'd like to make at the start. First of all, we record each of these sessions, so you can listen to them again afterwards. Secondly, we do have some slide where to show you, as well as a demonstration. And we'll email out a PDF copy to you after the session has ended. If you think it's useful for colleagues who aren't able to attend today, it may be possible for us to arrange a rerun of the session on a private basis, in which case send us an email afterwards or give us a call. And with regard to asking questions, well, unfortunately, all the lines are muted. So we ask you to use the in-chat facility. And Rachel will attempt to answer them as going along. If, if we can't answer them within the session, then obviously we will fill up, follow up with you offline. And of course, if you have questions after the session has ended, you can, of course, once again, drop us an email or give us a call, and we'll be happy to deal with them. If you don't know who Smart Vision Europe are, we are a technology company, and we specialize within the advanced analytics software world. So we're a premier accredited partner to IBM, SaaS, and a company called Predictive Solutions. We also work with open source technologies such as R, Python, and Spark. Um, each member of the team has 15 to 25 years of experience working in the advanced and predictive analytics space. We don't have any particular sector that we specialize in. We're across many different sectors. Uh, so we're, we're used to working with applications and everything from retail to insurance to finance to charity to central government, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I personally have worked for SPSS, IBM, and SAS as a senior consultant in the past. So decision trees is something that we're very, very used to using. It's one of the first tools that we reach for very often when we're working with customers on a particular application or particular project. Before we get into that, when you take a step back and talk about the concept of predictive analytics, we tend to use the term predictive analytics to describe the advanced analytics world that we work within. We're very aware, of course, that out there, in the wider world, people are talking about big data analytics, they're talking about data science, talking about machine learning. Predictive analytics is a banner term, and when you look it up in Wikipedia, it describes it as something that encompasses a variety of statistical techniques from predictive modeling, machine learning, and data mining that analyze current and historical facts to make predictions about future or otherwise unknown events. Now, strictly speaking, things like machine learning wouldn't fall into the realm of statistical techniques. They're, very, they're quite different. But Wikipedia is making the point that it's a smorgasbord of different techniques uh, all around the area of you know, high-end analytics. So it's a banner term. IBM emphasized the analysis of structured and unstructured information. So unstructured information being quantitative, unstructured being everything that's not quantitative, i.e. open-ended text, video, audio, all that sort of information that's exponentially growing over uh, each each uh, year since uh, since the start of the millennium. But it also includes predictive modeling and what if scenario analysis, so what we call uh, scenario planning, where we, we test out and simulate the effects of changing values and predicting what the outcomes would be. We think it's quite difficult to come up with a nice snappy definition of predictive analytics, given that it encompasses so many different analytical techniques and so many different analytical traditions. So we prefer to think about it in terms of a series of bullet points. And the first bullet point we make is that it is different from traditional BI or business intelligence or MI management information reporting. The second point is that, ironically, it's not always about prediction. There are many times when we're using predictive analytics capabilities or capabilities that are associated with predictive analytics. To, to do things which aren't strictly prediction, such as anomaly detection, or segmentation, or sequence analysis, not necessarily predicting things. Predictive uh, analytics does, however, in pretty much every application, 
create new important data. So new data that did not exist before. That's one of the things that makes it very different from BI or MI. So that's the point of predictive analytics is to create these new data. And these new data take the form of estimates, probabilities, forecasts or recommendations, propensity scores, anomaly values, classification, risk scores, likelihood values. And we take these new data and we use them to improve our insight and our decision making. We, by improving our decision making, we incorporate them into operational systems, such as a campaign management system to help us select people who are most likely to be interested in an offer, or a workforce management system to send people out uh, based upon risk scores to inspect assets that are likely to fail, and insight systems being things like visualization systems or existing BI systems such as Cognos, uh, uh, Tableau, that type of thing, or, or, or business objects, sometimes even just something as simple as Excel. The key here is that we're working towards creating these new data that will help us take an action uh, to, to improve uh, a particular outcome or to mitigate the effects of an outcome that we don't want to occur. So when we talk about predictive analytics, we tend to break it down into families of techniques and procedures. And the one that we're very much going to be focusing on today is the first one, which is classification or propensity modeling, which is you know who is most likely to respond or who is most likely to upgrade or recommend a product to a friend or defect, uh, i.e. churn, based upon their historical behavior that we have about them. Um, Classification propensity could also be who's most likely to you know, claim something on the insurance policy, or likely to renew an insurance policy, or people, or 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 a system that is likely to fail. It's an outcome that we wish to estimate. It's a key outcome. Cluster analysis, however, segmentation is more about you know clustering together similar rows of data. Very often, those rows of data will be individuals or customers. Well, people asking questions like, how can I divide my customers into meaningful and usable groups as a framework for marketing communications? Very often, organizations, of course, already have what they describe as customer segments defined. These are top-down descriptions. Cluster analysis, however, is a data-driven process where it looks at patterns of customer behavior or types of customer within a data set and then attempts to create homogenous groups from that in order that one can then personalize or treat them in a particular way on the basis that they belong to the same sort of uh, same sort of tribe or group. Then we have association and sequence analysis. Well, association is very much about looking at coincidental events or coincidental products that perhaps that go together. It's very strongly associated with something called basket analysis, which is where retailers are interested in knowing what products get purchased together over time. If it's looking at it over time, sometimes it's called affinity analysis. People buy this product, tend to buy this other product. What natural affinities exist within the data. But you can also use this for clusters of symptoms. So it's used in medical research. It's also used in engineering to try and find out what component parts are likely to fail together. And lastly, time series analysis, which is very much about forecasting from a data-driven standpoint, you know, from a ground-up uh, standpoint, where we're looking at a trend over time, such as demand or revenue or website hits or visitor numbers. And we're looking to forecast or extrapolate that out into the future. So we can say this is how many uh, of uh, those people we should expect to see, or this is the demand we should expect to see within a particular given time period, whether it be an hour, a day, a month, or a quarter, or even a year. So these are families, if you like, of predictive analytics applications. Where do decision trees fit within predictive analytics? Well, they're very much within the the, the process, the, the, the classification uh, uh, category, because they're very much trying to classify or predict an outcome. However, decision trees can be used, and they're uh, to build things like profiles of customers or employees or clients. So profile people in terms of their behavior. They're very widely and extensively used because they're so visual. 
and the profiling aspect of it is very visual and that's one of the reasons why they're popular second thing is is that they they build profiles and in doing so of course they're finding groups or segments of people who fit a certain profile so it can be a sort of directed segmentation tool in the sense that you're segmenting them in terms of something in terms of their likelihood to respond in terms of their likelihood to remain a customer and thirdly uh, because they can generalize well and because they can build these profiles we should be able to apply those profiles to new data and predict that outcome predict the key outcome that we're interested in so they're effectively predictive models as well and decision trees can be expressed as a series of hierarchical rules which means that they can be can be converted into common languages like sql for database storing, scoring so you can describe a decision tree to somebody. If it's a relatively simple decision tree, you can describe it as a series of, if you're in this group, then, and you're in this group, and you're in this group, then. There's an X percent chance you will do something. Decision trees are very popular because they're visual, and they're relatively easy to understand. They're almost modeling, uh, modeling without tears, if you like. So here's a simple example of a decision tree, a very common data set, which is available Throughout the internet, if you look at the data sets, you can find this data set. It's the Titanic data set. And when we look at what are the most important factors determining survival during the uh, during the sinking of the RMS Titanic, we're conscious of the fact that 32% of people survived and 68% of people did not. And this is a key uh, kind of a, a good question to ask. It's a good example to use because one of the problems that I have encountered and many consultants encounter when they're showing the results of a decision tree is that you know if you're not, not careful about it people will assume that the, the point of the decision tree is to tell them something very unusual something very secret something which they would not have known and yet when we when you look at something like second the titanic and you ask a room full of 30 people what do you think are the top three factors which drive survival on the titanic is very very easy for them to very, very quickly identify what those three factors are. In other words, the decision tree just chooses the factors that one would, would assume is more important. And those factors are, of course, things like gender, whether or not they're a male or female, and whether or not they're an adult or a child, and what class they're traveling in. These are the three top factors. So on the basis of that, you might think that, well, decision trees aren't really telling you anything new, and this is a real, that's a real problem because you know it means that somebody's missing the point. If they think that the point of the decision, the decision tree is to tell them something completely new, then they may be missing the point. That being said, there are subtleties within decision trees. Decision trees are very good at finding exceptions to rules. So yes, gender is important, age is important, class is important, but are there any exceptions to the rule? How would we find that out? Well, first of all, the decision tree needs to figure out which of these is the most important? Now, although you can ask a room full of 30 people what are the three factors are, and they'll identify them very quickly, if you ask them which is the most important factor, then you'll find it's fairly evenly split. And decision trees are good at that because they use uh, various statistics to try and identify what is the best discriminator between uh, an outcome. So and the outcome here is survival, of course. And one of the ways in which one of the decision trees work, this is a particular decision tree that we're going to see in a moment, one of the algorithms works by using a statistical test. And a statistical test is a chi-square test. So here, for example, we can see that when we look at gender, we can see that 73% of females survived and 21% of males survived. So there's a quite big difference here between survival rates of male and female. The chi-square test is a test to see whether or not these two factors are totally independent of one another or whether or not they are in some way related and when we get a value that is less than 0 0.05 it's showing us that the probability is less than five percent and five percent is usually the the uh, arbitrary cutoff point that statisticians use and we're saying it's a less than five percent chance that these differences we're observing occurred randomly and that is based upon a chi-square statistic. The chi-square statistic works by looking up the actual counts that we got here, how many people fell in these groups, and comparing it to the what's called the expected count. 
how many it would expect to get if there was no bias in the data, if you like. This is the equivalent of flipping a coin 100 times and finding it comes up 60 times heads, 40 times tails, and asking yourself, how often would you expect to see that randomly? When you know that the expected count is 50 heads and 50 tails, if there was completely no bias, so there was no random fluctuation within the coin. So the chi-square test creates this number, which is really the, the magnitude of all of the differences between the observed and expected. And the larger the number, the more likely it is, that the, or the less likely it is that the, what you're observing has occurred randomly by chance. That's basically what it's saying. So large chi-square values are associated with statistically significant relationships, to use a fairly hackneyed and crude term, but that's what they're associated with. And you can see here that certainly the differences between males and females that we're seeing here in terms of survival rates, that these are not random, uh, that there's a large chi-square value and the significance value is less than 0 0.05. So we would say, yep, yeah, probably chances are that that's not a fluke. If we look at the difference in adult and child, we find out that 31% of adults survived, 52% of the children. And again, a relatively large difference, but here the chi-square value is smaller. Nevertheless, the significance value is less than 0 0.05. It doesn't mean it's zero. It just means it can't display all of the decimal places. And if you double click on the cell within SPSS, it would show you the, the true number, which is probably quite a small number, but certainly less than 5%. As you can see, this number here is less than 0 0.05. So we would, we would equally conclude that age is important in terms of your survival, but perhaps not as important as the previous one, which is gender. And the last one is is uh, class, of course, the social class that people were traveling in, or the class of people traveling in that reflected their social class. 62% of those in first class survived compared to 41% of those in second class compared to 25% of those in third class compared to 24% of those in the crew. And again, that's quite a large chi-square value here. And it also generates a significant result, which is a value that's less than 0.05. It doesn't look like the chi-square value is as big as it is for gender. But there are certain adjustments we need to make to compare the two, um, something called degrees of freedom, which takes into consideration how many groups we have. But in reality, if we just looked at the, the true significance values, we could probably figure out you know, what the differences are, uh, which one is the most important, which factor is the most important. Suffice to say, when we build a decision tree using chi-square tests, it puts them in hierarchically in terms of their importance, in terms of their discriminatory power. And what we're interested in here, for example, is whether or not there are exceptions to the rule. For example, is second class, does second class always have a better survival rate than third class? Is whether or not you're whether or not you're an adult or child, is that always important, irrespective of what class you're traveling in, irrespective of what whether or not you're male or female. This is the sort of thing that decision trees are particularly good at. So when we build a decision tree using these three factors, and there's only three of them and two of them only have two outcomes, you get something like this. This is the top of the decision tree. And the decision tree here is using an algorithm called CHADE, which we'll come to in a second. It's telling us, of course, that there were 2,201 people on board. 32% survived. This is our baseline proportion. The, the survival is what's called the dependent variable or the target field. Green indicates did not survive, blue, sorry, and, and blue indicates survived. And using a chi-square test, it says, okay, well, here's the chi-square value, here's the degrees of freedom, and here's the probability value, which is less than 0 0.05. The best predictor of survival is gender. So gender goes in, or sex of, uh, of the passenger goes in. 1,731 men versus only 470 females. And we can see, of course, here that it shades the... Uh, the, the, the larger the larger number the, the, or the mode what's called the modal group size so the modal group which is the more popular group which is did not survive here 1364 78.8% versus here which is the modal group is 344 73% did survive it gives numbers to each of these groups called them node 1 and node 2 and it continues to build the tree from this point onwards and when we build the whole tree this is what we look like and 
K decision tree stands for chi square, it's using chi square, automatic, because it's automatically entering the variables, interaction, because it's looking at the interactions between the variables, detector. So here we can see for males <clears throat> that if you're a male adult, there were 1,667 of them, only 20% survived. But if you're a male child, and there were 64 of them, 45% survived. If you're a male adult and you're in first class, there are 175 of those, 32% survived. If you're in second class, 8.3% survived. And if you're in third class, 16% survived. So it's interesting for males here, whether or not you're in second or third class does make a difference. You know, if you're an adult male, it turns out that third class, you've actually got slightly better, but twice as likely to survive than if you're in second class. If you're in crew, you're 22% likely to survive them. For females, we notice that age is not used here. That is because it is not statistically significant. There is no point adding age into the female group of 470 uh, individuals because it didn't make a difference. So if you're an adult uh, uh, female or a child female, it does not affect your survival rate, so it doesn't use it. However, the social class does, where 97% of females in first class survive. But what's interesting is that second class and crew are grouped together here. So that's another thing that the shade decision tree does. It will group categories which are not different from one another together. And that their survival is 87%. Females in third class' survival rate is only 45.9%. And there are 195 of them. Everybody on board ends up in one of these, if you'll forgive the phrase, terminal nodes, ends up in one of these boxes. So that means that everybody ends up in this node here, node 8, 9, 10, 11, 4, 5, 6, or 7. So that means you end up with basically uh, eight probability values. And the probability values are, of course, your likelihood of, if you, if, you want to, if you focus on one group, your survival, you're going to get eight different numbers that say these are your probability of survival. So that's how a decision tree works. You know, it's automatically selecting the variables, building it. Uh, hierarchically and studying it. And of course, it stops at some point. It stops when it can no longer go any further because it can no longer find any more significant relationships. In this case, it stops because there's no more variables to use. Okay? It might stop because it actually gets down into such small groups of cases that the, the, you know it's hit a minimum threshold or it can no longer find any statistically significant groups with such a small sample size. Something else to bear in mind is that we can actually put in continuous, that is numerical uh, variables into a decision tree. So far, we've been looking at category variables. And these numerical predictor fields, the independent fields, are automatically split into tenths or deciles by the decision tree. And it finds the inflection points within that. So for example, here, Amount and savings or investment would have been split into into deciles, equal tenths. And it says if you are uh, you've got less than four less than or equal to four thousand three hundred and ninety five, I think it's dollars, in your savings or investment account here, um, then use a twenty eight percent chance that you will buy this particular financial service, whatever it is. Whereas if you're between four thousand three hundred ninety five and six thousand one hundred and fifty. There's a 48% chance you buy, and if you're 6,150 to 8,000, 63% chance, and over 8,000, 78% chance. So you can imagine how different discount values given to different groups of customers, one could one could use a decision tree to find the exact inflection points whereby, you know, what the response rate is based upon the level of discount that you're giving. It's very powerful in that sense. So let's see a quick demonstration of that. We're only going to take a little while here. And we're going to go out to uh, SPSS uh, statistics, which has a decision tree module within it. So SPSS statistics has a base module. So for example, the sorts of things one would get in the base module. If I just went along here and look and show you this data, let me show you some data here. So I'll just... Um, and just right click and we've got some data here. What we've got, we've got uh, 300 records, only 300 records. We've got a field here called age. And if we run the uh, descriptive statistics on that, it tells us the mean age is 42 and that the range goes from 
18 to 49, so it's a fairly narrow range of individuals, whoever these are. Uh, their income ranges as well, from uh, 5,000 to 58,000. And the number of children that they have, well, actually, we could probably do a, a, a frequency table on that. So if I said children, said so number of children that they've got, and click OK at that point, it tells me that, you know, nobody, nobody in this group's got more than three children. It might be that three is three maximum. 42% of zero, 20% one, 25% two, 11% three. Then we've got disposable income, which is probably the ratio of children to and the number of children you have, some sort of ratio of that to your income. We've got gender, let's look at gender here. So it's um, it's nearly even, 51 to 48.3. The region that they live in. And we've got the other things like marital status, whether or not they've got a car, whether or not they've got a savings account, a current account, a mortgage. And then this key field here, which is, did they buy home insurance? So you could explore this data, one could look at the relationships and interactions for it. For example, here, if I can do a cross tab, I could look at a cross tab between gender and whether or not people buy home insurance. And I could ask for some row percentages and ask it to do a statistical test, just like the chi-square test we saw earlier. And click OK. And it's actually telling me that, you know, overall, it's, it's almost borderline. You see, it's very close to 0 0.05 there. But technically speaking, that's that wouldn't get used in a in a shade decision tree, uh, not not straight away, not unless it was a subgroup of another variable, because it's 0 0.05, it's above the threshold, which is 0 0.05. It's saying there's a 5.5 percent chance that the differences we're observing here uh, could have occurred randomly. And what we're seeing is that 60 percent, 39 percent of females uh, have home insurance compared to 50 percent of men. And this, that's that's kind of on the threshold. That's possible that 57 versus 78, that that could have happened randomly. So this is exactly what a decision tree does. I mean, if we want, if we didn't have a decision tree and we we're trying to figure out who buys home insurance, of course, we could do this. We could say, let's look at region now and we'll do a test against that. And region comes in, region's not statistically significant. But then we'd have to say, well, let's look at region uh, broken down by whether or not they're male or female. So now we've got a combination of the two because there's two combinations that's saying, okay, for each region here, here's the females, inner city, rural, suburban, and town, males, inner city, rural, suburban, and town, they're not about home insurance, and it gives me statistical tests, and none of them are. So there's an awful lot of different permutations. I could then say, okay, let's split that even further by whether or not they're a car owner. And it wouldn't be really, you know, it wouldn't be very practical for us to do that because there are so many different permutations and combinations of variables against this key outcome. So it's really ripe for a decision tree to be used here. So if we go to analyze, we can call up the decision tree module within SPSS statistics. And if you have that module, uh, you can access it under the classify menu here and it comes up with tree, okay? So the dependent variable is the thing we're trying to predict, which is our key outcome here, which is uh, home insurance. And if I just check that, you can see that a value of two means yes, they have home insurance. And what we're interested in is telling it that our special target group here is yes. If we've got more than one target, we're actually only in, more than one target group, we're actually only interested in one of them, we can exclude some of them. We don't use ID, obviously, because that's just a random number effectively, it doesn't tell us anything. You can see some of these are continuous variables, some of them aren't. And we're going to use all of these as independent variables, these are predictors. So this group down here are the predictors, and this one up here is the dependent or the target field. And because there's only 300 cases in here, I'm going to change some of the default values and allow it to go down to quite small group sizes of 20 and 10. So I'm going to go down to what's called a child node size of 10. So at this point now, the decision tree will, will be built, and it's going to run a whole bunch of uh, uh, statistical tests using chi-square tests against this target field. You can see the growing method here is CHADE. There are, in fact, other methods, something called exhaustive CHADE, something called classification and regression tree, sometimes called a CART algorithm and a QUEST algorithm. There's more than one algorithm. CHADE's probably one of the most common ones. And there's all these different criteria we can use. We can tell it how deep we're going to allow it to go. 
uh, we can tell it what the what the confidence, uh, sorry, what the probability value that it should use in order to find splits between data. Um, we can tell it for scale variables not to split them into tenths, but maybe to split them into twentieths if we want it, for example, here. Or we can even use our own custom ones here. We can say, okay, if it, age should be twentieths, number of children tenths, etc. So you can really go down to quite a fine degree. And so on and so on. But we'll just leave it there and we'll click OK at that point and just run the decision tree and see what happens. So we run that tree. It does it very quickly in the background and we can see the decision tree that's created. So we'll double click on it. It's a quite a simple one. These are quite simple trees. Some of them can, of course, be quite complex because you might have a lot of data and you might have a lot of factors. And if I just click on this button here, it'll show me tables and charts in the notes. So the blues are the yes group. These are the people who, who did buy the home insurance and the reds are those who don't. And it's finding, first of all, that the number of children people have is a key predictor of uh, whether or not people buy home insurance. If they have zero children, then 60, let me just zoom in a bit here. Then I'll go in a little bit further. In fact, I'll go into uh, 20%. Oh, sorry. You can see it's 64% no's, whereas if they have one child, which is this group here, 85% yes. If they have more than one child, then it goes back down again, 67%. So it's interesting that that's the case. If they have more than one child, but their disposable income is over 14724 then 91% of them buy this financial product. If it's less than that, 93%. This is the classic example of an exception to the rule. Notice that this uh the tree does not split any further at this point it can no longer find any more significant groups to find there's no more variables put in or it, if it does put another variable in it will create a group size which is too small and we set a group size a minimum of 10. and for those who have one child however it doesn't use an uh, estimated disposable income it just uses estimated income and it says if you have one child and your estimated income is greater than 15,499, then 96% of them buy the product. And if they are a savings account holder as well, then they all buy the product. 30, 37, uh, 37 cases, they're 100%. Whereas over here, for those who have zero children, if they are not currently married, then 68% buy the product. If they are currently married, 81% of them don't. And if they are a mortgage customer, then that drops to 40%, uh, actually by the product 60% don't. If they're not a mortgage customer, then it's uh, only 10% by the product. So again, it's going to subgroup, subgroup, subgroup. We get into small group sizes here. It does not go any further and it stops at that point. So this is a profile of the individuals. Let's have a look here. So number of children, estimated income, disposable income, married, mortgage customer, and savings account holder. These are the variables which have gone in. So things like car has not been used, region has not been used. I don't think gender was used there. So these variables were not used because they were not statistically significant, or were not found to be significant in any of the subgroups. And if we were to use this model, we wanted to predict it and see how accurate it is. Um, if we go down to the bottom here, it gives me a little table here saying, these are the gains, this is called the gains table. This is telling me which are the best nodes to use. And there's different ways which, which we can work with this, but saying that node number 15 is the best node to use, so we can see that node here. So um, uh, node number 15 will, of course, be those probably those with yeah, 100% yes, because I've identified yes as my key group. So is that your best node there, people who fall into that one? And uh, you know, the uh, it finds 37 off the people who bought off the people who bought. The insurance company, uh, insurance product that finds 37 of them straight away, which is 27% of the people who bought it. That has an index value of 222. That means you are two, uh, it means you're more than twice as likely uh, to, to buy the product if you're in that group than if you're not. And of course, that makes sense because the percentage of people who buy the product overall, if I just go back to the tree, is uh, it's, it's only it's 45% on the course. 100% is more than twice 45%. And down here, it's telling me how accurate it is based upon the sample. We're not actually doing a test here, so we're not testing the data. We've got quite a small data sample. We could do that. 
So it's saying it's correctly identifying 95% of the no's and 79% of the yeses at this point. So it's actually correctly identifying. So this is now a predictive model. This is how well that, that profile does at predicting the outcome. Now, if we wanted to use this tree, if we thought if we were very, you know, if we're very confident about it, we could actually use this tree to predict an outcome. And there are various ways in which we can do that. So I could go here to uh, the decision tree and run it again. If I go into criteria, sorry, if I go into, sorry, output, I can ask it to show me various types of plots, like a gains chart and response and all that stuff. But one of the things I can do is I can ask it to generate rules. And these rules could be SPSS syntax, which identifies the best terminal nodes, the best top, say the top 10, if it was a very big tree. Or I can give them a threshold. I can say all terminal nodes. I can get it to assign values or to select cases. But the other thing I do is I could actually ask it to write it out as SQL. And SQL would then, I could then take that SQL and, and, and apply it back into a database. Perhaps the database has many more customers who have not yet been offered that product. And using the pattern in the tree, it would predict these outcomes. What would the outcomes look like that it predicted? Well, the outcomes would look like this. So we hit save. We can ask for these outcomes. So I hit continue here and click OK. Reruns the tree. And we can see here, here are the outcomes it's predicting. And the outcomes are that this one, this, this case here would belong to, to node number 14, that's segment 14. It would predict it to be a value of two. Two, as we can see here, means yes, a responder. The probability of it being a one is 0.14, a 14%. And the probability of it being a two is 0.86%, say 86% chance. And you can see, obviously, if this is above 0.5, it gets predicted as a one, and if it's above 0.5 over here, it gets predicted as a two. Very often, uh, marketeers will simply look at the probability value rather than the classification and say, okay, anybody above a certain threshold, let's say you have a, a 4% response rate to a mail shop. Well, anybody above 4% means that they have a, you know, a greater than a standard likelihood of responding to that mail shop. So it might, it might, it might select anybody above 0 0.04 in here. Um, or above a certain threshold based on a based on a budget. So one of the things I can do is I can I can write this tree out and say okay I want to write this tree out and save it as a model. So I can say switch these off and say okay, I'll have all of that and that and I'll, I'll give it a name. I've got one here called insurance.xml. I hit save. I'll just replace it. I hit continue. It says it already exists. You want to write it override it? I say yes. Click OK. And it's basically written the model out and zipped it up, if you like. It zipped it up so that um, it's, uh, it's, it's turned it into a file so that I can then go and open up another data set. And I'll open up another data set here. I've got one here called insurance scoring extract. I'll explain what that means in a second. You can see that this is a much larger data set. There's 89,000 records in it. And if we, if we were confident and we'd done our testing, uh, based upon our sample of 300, and we thought that's a pretty good model. We could apply that insurance XML model back to this data set. So we could zip up the model and apply it to this data set, which we'll do in a second. Notice this data set does not have a field indicating whether or not they have home insurance, because of course they haven't been offered it yet. And our point here is that we're trying to predict who's going to get, who we should offer it to. This is known as scoring the data. That's what uh, people talk about scoring. And I have a little utility here, procedure here called scoring wizard. So I find my file called insurance and I say next. And it says, okay, these are the fields I need. So it's looking for the fields. Say, have you got these fields? And I say, yes, I've got these fields. If for whatever reason it wasn't called income in the scoring data set, it was called ink or something like that, I could, I could map these across here. So it isn't too fussy and it makes it fairly easy for me. You can see it's only using five fields to score it. At next, it says, what do you want me to create? Because these are the fields going to create. Do you want me to show you the, 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 you know, the, the uh, node number, the confidence? So I don't need the confidence. What I'll ask for is the probability that they're in the two, the predicted value, and the node number. If I hit next at that point, hit finish. It'll score it now, or it'll paste it as syntax, or I can score it later. So I hit finish at this point. It's applying the model now to that. Uh, target data set. You can see it's scoring data. And here it is. It says, I reckon this guy's going to be uh, 
one of these special nodes, number 15, where there's a hundred percent of them uh, fell into the category two, which is the yes group for buying uh, uh, for uh, you know buying the insurance uh, product. Here, for example, we have somebody that's in node number who would belong to node number eight, and they have a 0.07 percent chance of buying insurance, so of buying, sorry, buying this insurance policy, and therefore they're predicted to be a one or a no. And if it makes it easier for you, I can, I can just go in here and say, okay, well, look, um, one means nope, don't mail, and two means yes, do mail. So let's add a couple of little labels to it. And there you have it, yes or no. These are the predictions which are coming out. So that's, that's us walking through the decision tree. There are different types of decision trees we could use there, but that's the basic one. And that's why people are really uh, investing in that product within SPSS statistics. It's a very simple, easy product to use. It's, it's very visual and uh, it allows them to, to produce these predictions. Okay. There are other things that decision trees are used for. They're not just for predicting whether or not somebody's going to accept an offer of home insurance or something like that but we can use it to profile people in terms of demographics for example here we have you know if we wanted to predict whether or not somebody would find who, what the profile is of people in an ethnic minority based on a corporation or a bank it's interesting that the first thing it, it selects for that is what their employment category is and then it selects their age over here on the manager it selects months since hire where the red group here is only 20, 22 percent of them are people in ethnic minorities and the blue group isn't. Another one is when we do cluster analysis and it produces clusters for us, produces groups or segments for us within the data and we then want to interpret those segments. A good way to do that is to use a, a decision tree here for example it says it's, it's found four groups within a customer database or within some EPOS data for a retailer and it said basically if they bought beer, they're much more likely to belong to customer customer group four. And if they bought canned vegetables, then they all pretty much belong to customer group four. If, however, they didn't buy beer, but they did buy wine, then they belong to customer group three. And if they didn't buy wine, but they bought uh, and they didn't buy confectionery, then they're more likely to belong to customer group one, and so on and so on. So it's giving us a little profile as to what these different uh, uh, segments are. So it's a kind of a profiling tool. Another way here is drivers of satisfaction. This is a HR survey where the individuals have been asked to indicate in an anonymized survey you know, how long they think they're going to last or, or remain with the company. Some people have said, I'll leave within two years. Some people said two to five years. And some people said, remain at least five years. And what we find is that, for example, if they say that attitude of senior staff is better than good, probably excellent then the vast majority of them say they'll remain if they say it's less than or equal to fair then the majority of them say they'll leave within two years and if they say it's just good then the big discriminator is their attitude to general admin and organization if they say it's better than good then quality of equipment starts to break them down into people who are likely to leave two to five years or remain uh, at least five years so hopefully you get some sort of sense of how that works. If you go onto our website, you'll see many videos and, and materials that we have uh, that, that around decision trees and around similar types of algorithms to that. So it's well worth checking out. And in fact, we have on the website a free tool that you can download called the uh, Key Driver Analysis, which isn't a decision tree, but it's a free tool that you can use in conjunction with SPSS statistics which will uh, you know identify what are the most important variables against the target variable which is quite useful with regard to the software we're using here well you can buy that software directly from us often with discounts you can go on to our website and have a little look around you can download a trial copy if you want to try one out uh, we also of course offer training and consultancy services to help you develop your own in-house skills and even identification and recruitment of analytical skills in your organization we are a support providing partner to SAS and SPSS, so we'll, we'll offer no strings attached technical and business advice relating to analytical activities, and we'll log tickets and uh, progress your technical support um, uh, queries. I hope you find that useful. It isn't quite the weekend yet, but we're nearly there, so I do hope that you have a great weekend, and I do hope that you will log in again 
at some point in the near future to see our next segment. Thank you.